if your function has a branch point, a logarithm, or some non-integer power function, you know that you need to be careful. We can still use contra-integration, but we will need to make an indentation around branch points. We obviously cannot integrate right through it. And furthermore, we need to stay away from the branch cut. We cannot intersect the branch cut with our contour. You will see an example of such an integral in this video. We look at the real integral from 0 to infinity, x to the power a, x squared plus 1 squared, and a has to be between minus 1 and 3. So why are those boundaries on a? Well, we can see that, we, we can take a look at that first. So why has a to be bigger or equal than 3? Well, uh, for very large values of x, you can kind of neglect the one over here. So your uh, uh, denominator uh, behaves like this, x to the power 4. If the power in the numerator now would be higher than 3, your total function would behave like x to the power of 3 divided by x to the power of 4, 1 over x, or worse for large x. So for large x, you will get something like logarithm of x, or even bigger. That's going to blow up in the integral, your integral is never going to converge. So that's why a has to be bigger or equal than 3. Uh, that's why, sorry, a cannot be bigger or equal than 3. Your integral will never so not interesting at all. Why? Uh, why does a have to be bigger than minus 1? So what happens if a is smaller or equal than minus 1? Well, then we're going to look what happens for small values of x, close to 0. For small values of x, you can basically neglect it's x squared, so you're dividing by 1, so your function will behave like it's x to the power a. If a now would be smaller or equal to minus 1, then your function would behave like 1 over x or 1 over x squared or, or something like that. So your antiderivative would behave like the ln of x or uh, minus 1 over x or something like that. And if going for x going to 0, that will blow up. So also, if your a is smaller or equal to minus 1, and it was going to blow up, so no, no fun at all. So you know already that certainly your a has to be between minus 1 and 3, otherwise the integral is going to blow up. Notice though that somehow during your computation you will need to use those boundaries. They are, they are given, you know you, you know you need them, so it has to come out somewhere in the computation. So if you do a computation like this, you don't use those conditions, you probably do it some, something somewhere wrong. Now, first problem, hardest problem always, choose your function and your contour. Well, we have a z to the power a. z to the power a is causing the misery. Well, z to the power a equals e to the power a log z, small log of z. And we have to choose uh, a branch cut somehow. Well, we want to include L1. Uh, we definitely want to close the contour. So for r to going to infinity cr, well, we will be fine. Uh, we can make a small zero. And how are we going to close the contour? Where are we going to put the branch cut now? Well, if we want to close along L2, well, that's possible. We go halfway and then close like this. That's fine, but then we cannot put our branch cut along the negative real axis. We cannot use the, uh, the, the principal value of the argument. We have to put our Contour, some, uh, sorry, we have to put our branch cut somewhere else. Well, that's no problem, because we have to join the origin to the point at infinity, and we can also do it along the negative imaginary axis, so our branch cut is out of the way. That does have a consequence, of course, and has a consequence for the choice of the argument of set. So if we put our branch cut along the negative imaginary axis, it means that the argument will be between minus pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So now we are set to go. Our integral along L1 will give us the desired integral. Uh, hopefully, the integrals along C rho and CR will vanish. And, uh, well, along L2, something could go wrong, of course. Let's see what happens over there. Well, second step theorem of residues. Well, then. Integral along c total f z dz equals 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. Well, the function f of z is analytic on an inside uh, the contour c total, except at the point uh, z equals i over here, because we are dividing by 0 over there. Uh, uh, at z equals i, we have a pole of order 2. So we have to compute the residue at 
z equals i. Well, we can re rewrite fz as z to the power a. Uh, we have at, divide by, well, the z squared plus 1 equals z plus i times z minus i. If you square that, you get the z minus i squared times z plus i squared. So we can compute our phi of z. f of z equals uh, uh, phi of z divided by the z minus i squared. So phi of z is an analytic function, z to the power a divided by z plus i squared, which is nice and analytic. But we have to be careful with our z to the power a. z to the power a equals e to the power a log of z. Uh, now we have a pole of order 2, so we also need phi prime. Uh, the residue nz0 equals i equals phi prime at i divided by 1 factorial. So first we compute phi prime. Careful with that, we use the quotient rule. So we have the derivative of the exponential function. Yields the exponential function times what's the derivative of what's the exponential, so a over z times exponential function times denominator minus derivative of denominator times the uh, numerator, so minus 2 times z plus i times the numerator divided by the denominator squared. Uh, you see a uh, log of z uh, here. You have to plug in i, so we have to wonder what's log of i. Well, the log of i equals the ln of the norm plus i times the argument. Oh, careful with the arguments. The ln of the norm is just 0, so that's fine, ln of 1 equals 0. The argument of i, well, we choose our argument between minus pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Our i as, us, as this is argument pi over 2. So the log of i will be i times pi over 2. So now we can compute phi prime of i. We divide by uh, i plus i to the power 4, so we divide by 2i to the power 4 equals 16. So, and then in the numerator we get a over z, uh, a o equals a over i equals minus i times a, times e to the power a log z equals e to the power a times i times pi over 2, because we had our log of i to be i times pi over 2, uh, times z plus i squared, i plus i equals 2i, squared equals minus 4, so minus 4 over there. And then minus the second term, minus 2 times z plus i, z, pl z plus i equals i plus i equals 2i. So we get a minus 4i times the same exponential, which is an awful mess. So let's clean up a bit of the mess. It has this exponential in common, both terms. The first term there we have a 4i over 16 times a, so i over 4 times a, so i over 4 times a for the first term. And the second term we have a uh, minus 4i over 16, so uh, uh, minus i over 4, so this is the second term. So it cleans already up a bit of the mess. And then the total integral equals 2 pi i times the, uh, the residue, so multiply by 2 pi i, you get uh, pi uh, minus pi over 2 times a minus 1, or uh, plus pi over 2 times 1 minus a times this exponential. End of the second step. You have the total integral. It is some Awkward complex number. Step 3. Parameterize L1 and L2. Well, L1 is okay. In L1 we have z equals x. Uh, argument of z equals 0 because the argument has to be between minus pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So the argument is 0 over here. So we can compute f of z. The denominator is fine, it's just x squared plus 1 squared. And in the numerator, we get e to the power a uh, log of z, which is the ln of the value of x, plus i times the argument, which is just 0 over here. So we get uh, x to the power a divided by x squared plus 1 squared. So that's for L1. And we run from rho to r, so our integral along L1 runs from rho to r. And this is our r function, which is exactly the function we want. Then along L2, that could spoil all the fun, of course. And L2, we choose z equals minus x. Careful again now with the argument. Argument now equals pi, uh, because again, due to, to this boundary from the argument, so we have to choose our argument pi. What, what do we get as our f of z? 
Well, the denominator is okay because we have an x squared, so this uh, z equal, we have a z squared, so minus z squared just, uh, just yields an x squared, so that's part's no problem. Then in the numerator, we get e to the power a log z, so the ln of z equals minus x, plus i times argument, so plus i times pi. So here we get, uh, again, x to the power a, which is fine, but an additional factor, e to the power i by a. So integral along L2, uh, we start at R and we go up to rho, so we go from R to rho. Uh, uh, we have uh, z equals minus x, so here d minus x, our function. You can take the e to the power i pi a in front, and you can uh, uh, get rid of the minus sign by interchanging the order of the boundaries of integration. And you see, if you look at the final integral along L1, and along L2, they are exactly the same apart from a factor e to the power i by a. So th th they give the desired integral times 1 plus i by a. One contribution along L1 and factor e to the power i by a from the contribution on L2. That's step 3. On to step 4, let's get rid of the contributions on C rho and on Cr. Well, uh, we have to. Uh, we are going to use ML estimates, so we have to estimate uh, the function on C rho. On C r, we can use a, a similar estimate. On C rho, we have the norm of z squared plus 1, it's the triangle inequality. Norm of a plus b is bigger or equal than the norm of absolute value of norm a minus norm b. So the norm of z squared plus 1 is bigger or equal than norm of z squared minus the norm of 1. Along C rho, norm of z squared equals rho squared, so we get a rho squared minus 1, absolute value. Rho will be typically very small, so that will be 1 minus rho squared. So f of z is bounded by smaller equal than. Uh, the norm of z equals norm z to the power a divided by norm of z squared plus 1 squared. And it's smaller than, use this estimate we just had, uh, 1 minus rho squared squared. And the numerator, norm of the numerator is just rho to the power a. And we'll go that, we will call that m rho. Now we can use an ml estimate to get rid of this integral. We know that the modulus of this integral is smaller or equal than m rho times pi rho if f is bounded by m rho on c rho, which is the case we just showed that, what we had to choose. So we'll, what we get is that that equals pi times rho to the power a plus 1 divided by 1 minus rho squared, squared. So what happens if rho tends to 0? Well, no problem in the denominator, because that will just behave like a 1. And in the numerator, we have a rho to the power a plus 1. Now, a is bigger than minus 1. You had it in the beginning. a is bigger than minus 1. So rho to the power a plus 1 is rho to some positive power. And taking rho to 0, this numerator will tend to 0. So in the limit rho to zero, uh, this term equals zero. So that means that the limit rho to zero, the modulus of the integral uh, equals zero, which means that li the limit rho to zero, integral tends to zero. That's for C rho. On to CR. Uh, well, on CR we have a similar, uh, similar estimate because we are also on a circle. Uh, so we choose uh, MR similarly as r to the power a divided by r squared minus one squared. We again use a ML estimate, this modulus of the integral is smaller or equal than MR times pi times capital R, because the uh, length of the curve is now pi times capital R, equals uh, pi times r to the power a plus 1 divided by r squared minus 1 squared. So what happens for uh, big values of r? So what happens in the limit r to infinity? Well, now the uh, uh, denominator is going to blow up as well. So we divide by r to the power 4, both numerator and denominator. And numerator, we get r to the power a minus 3, because we divide by r to the power 4. And if you divide by r to the power 4, you can take it in here. Uh, you, you have to divide by r squared, so you get a 1 minus r to the power minus 2. And now you see the limit r to the infinity, your uh, denominator tends to 1. So we get a pi times r to the power a minus 3 divided by something which tends to 1. Well, a is smaller than 3. Now we use the second constraint from the, from the start. a is smaller than 3, which means that a to the power 
uh, sorry, r to the power a minus 3 will r be r to some negative power. So if r goes to infinity, r to some negative power will tend to zero. So that's why this limit equals zero. And then we are done because uh, if uh, in the limit r to infinity, modulus of the integral, the a equals zero, hence the integral itself equals zero in the limit. End of step four. On to step five. Wrap up everything, combine everything. Well, the integral uh, L1 joint L2 Fz dz equals uh, the residue minus contributions along zero and CR. Now we take limits on left hand side and right hand side. On the left hand side, uh, it's easy to take the limits uh, r to zero and uh, r to infinity uh, because the uh, only thing that happens is that the boundary of the integrals become zero and infinity. On the right hand side, we have to be slightly careful taking limits rho to zero and r to infinity. Well, all uh, limits exist, which means that the uh, limit of the sum equals the sum of the limits. Sum of the limits, well, there's no limit here, so that's standard. And the other ones, as we have seen in step four, all the limits are both zero. So now we know that this uh, integral times factor over here equals this factor over there. But well, uh, this integral over here is a real integral, but it does not look really real at the moment. But we can see why it is real by multiplying by on left and right by e to the power minus i a times pi over 2. We do that, this factor here vanishes. And on the left hand side, we get a 1 times e to the power minus i a pi over 2 and e to the power i a pi over 2 over there. Still doesn't look that real, but now we recognize on the left hand side that the, this factor here is just 2 times the cosine of a pi over 2, and this factor is real. And we can solve, and there we have our integral for all values of a. Well, final uh, wording. You have to be with this final formula. You may wonder, uh, well, what, uh, okay, between minus 1 and 3 it's all fine because this cosine is never zero. But you might wonder whether there is a problem for a equals 1. Because if you plug in a equals 1, you get cosine power of 2 equals 0. So you're dividing by 0 for a equals 1. Well, the discussion of the uh, a equals 1 case, the formula still holds. Uh, I, I will leave that uh, to you in the comment section below.